welcome to another episode of Bad Ideas, the show where we look at misfires, mistakes, and miscalculations from all throughout history. I'm Tony Southcott. I'm Albert Berg. And today we have a special guest joining us, the first guest on Bad Ideas. This is Tuna from the Unranked Podcast. I had the pleasure of meeting him while we were at the Play NYC conference a few weeks ago. We hit it off and we decided we were going to do some fun like cross-promotional stuff and <laughs> pop over to Unranked, have him come over here, all that good stuff. Yes. I'm actually really happy to be here. Uh, when you told me about this podcast at uh, New York City Play, I was loving it because I love history and I thought this was a fantastic idea. Um, and I- I'm psyched. I'm really excited to be yeah. here. And uh, just real quickly, tell them about uh, the Unranked podcast, just so they know. Yeah, so the Unranked podcast is a video game uh, podcast that I host with uh, my friends Chris, Tom, and Dan. Uh, we talk about video games, we talk about our lives, we talk about uh, when we you know, play video games, video game news, stuff like that. I have a complaint section on there where I kind of go into my complaints about life, not video game related. Sometimes we go off topic. And at the end of every episode, we play uh, a game. And it's, it's a lot of fun. And you have brought us a bad idea today, is that correct? I, I have brought one bad idea that I was, during my research, I, I had a lot of information to go through. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't think we want to sit here for like five hours. So I tried to condense it down as po- you know, as short as possible um, without leaving any of the major plot points out. But it is Napoleon's uh, campaign in Russia in 1812, which pretty much spelled his failure, pretty much spelled the disaster for him as a general, as a leader, pretty much just like as a person. He kind of fails after this and then he's done. I've only read books on uh, Waterloo. I've heard about this, and I know how bad of a disaster it was, but I don't know the specifics, so I'm excited to hear about this. What's interesting... Yeah, you said five hours earlier. I think this is <laughs> one you definitely could actually talk about for five hours if you were like, if, if you were covering the, the details. A- absolutely. If you and I had a bottle of whiskey and we wanted to talk about Napoleon's campaign in Russia all night, we would have no problem finishing off the bottle and still having time to keep going. Um, what's interesting though that you bring up Waterloo is that during my research even though I thought I knew a lot already about Napoleon Waterloo actually comes after this which I didn't I didn't know that it's after he like comes back and kind of takes over for a little bit and undoes like them reinstating a monarch it's kind of a weird time for France it's so weird he he like after this campaign he abdicates then he gets exiled to Elba then he comes back back from exile and then he does the hundred i think it's hundred days war and then he fails at waterloo loses and that's it and then he's exiled across the atlantic and see you later napoleon that's the end of that yeah and really doesn't like leave that much of an impact other than sort of like historically he's a huge figure but if you think about what did napoleon change it's like he, he comes to france and it's sort of a monarchy and he leaves and like things things change but it's like what what legacy does napoleon have today anyway i know that's not about russia but (laughs) yeah short stature jokes um (laughs) despite being average height for the time right despite being average height for the time a uh, complex named after him right total big time complex to i feel like he's pretty i mean if you say napoleon people think of like a good military general Oh, definitely. I, he won a lot of battles, but I'm thinking, you know, compare him to Alexander the Great or Genghis Khan. Those guys changed the face of the world. But what? what so let's get into the nitty gritty here as much right. as we can anyway. Russia. All right, Russia. All right, so so, Nepal, so here's another little fun fact about Napoleon. He was born in Corsica, which was an independent Italian city-state, previously ruled by the Republic of Genoa, which I didn't know that i did not know that napoleon was actually italian and that his name was like bonaparte i didn't know that i mean maybe you guys did not sure but um i did not yeah i knew it was bonaparte i just didn't put it together that that's more of an italian name yeah crazy right and then so he's born in corsica the same year that france kind of takes it over conquers it brings it into the fold he speaks Corsican and Italian. He doesn't actually speak French. He doesn't start learning French until age 10, which I thought was another interesting fact about Napoleon. So he joins uh, the French army in 1789. During the French Revolution, he starts getting promotion after promotion. He's killing it in the French army. He becomes a general at the age of 24. 
basically what ended up happening was he published a pro Republican pamphlet that gets the attention of Robespierre's brother, Augustine. So he gets appointed artillery commander of the Republican forces at the siege of Toulon. Again, I'm not a historian. I don't know how to pronounce these words, but, you know, we'll, we'll go with it. He dominates We're there. We're used to this. That's fine. Yeah. yeah. He, people come in here for uh, the obscure history, not so much for our pronunciation. Good. We are bad at that. Good. Good. He dominates at the siege. He gets promoted to brigadier general at 24, and he's put in charge of France's army in Italy. So... At this time, he wins virtually every battle between 1795 and 1799. He conquers Italy, becomes famous. He's like, you know, big man in France. So during this time, right, the European monarchies are waging war against the revolutionary forces in what will be known as the Coalition Wars. This will come up later. But um, it's basically the Holy Roman Empire, Britain, Austrians, Prussians, and Russians... So in 1799, the directory, a five-member committee that governed France in 1795, they're losing popularity. They're losing the Second Coalition War. Directory's bankrupt and unpopular. Napoleon comes in, coup d'etat, 1799, overthrows the directory, becomes first consul. Boom. Treaty signed. He gets with uh, some European powers, and he's like, all right, we're going to start consolidating some power here in Europe. So... He starts dodging. Do you know if that was a violent coup d'etat or was that more no, it was bloodless. He pulled? Bloodless. Couldn't believe it when I read that. I also thought that he was that he took over <laughs> via like a big coup. Oh, I mean, like in that time period, it's like, well, there's a lot of monarchs and a lot of people getting beheaded. So you thought that he would be part of that sort of thing. You would think. So apparently during this time as well, he's dodging assassination plots left and right. So he uses this as a springboard to establish the imperial system. And basically, though not literally, which is also something I found out, he crowns himself Emperor of the French. He doesn't actually put the crown on his head like I thought that I had heard. But what he does is he puts the crown on Josephine, his wife. A little uh, little sneaky sort of indirect action there. Exactly. So he's like, well, he's basically saying I'm the big man here. I'm controlling like Julius Caesar maintaining the Senate, even though he's really the one who's in charge. Exactly. Pretty much. I mean, that's basically what he did. He basically established a dictatorship in all but name and was like, I'm I'm just the ruler of France now. And you guys all submit to me. So this is that's how he rose to power. All right. So he invades Russia. So why does he invade Russia? So he invades Russia because here, here comes the coalition wars again in the third coalition. Right. Napoleon forms his Grand Armée. He defeats the Third Coalition at the Battle of Austerlitz and basically eliminates the Holy Roman Empire. Now, these... Uh, can I ask a question? So these guys that he's defeated, they are other French people who don't like him or they're from another country? What is this coalition exactly? Right, so the coalition kind of rotates between Holy Roman Empire, uh, the Austrians, the Prussians, the Russians, the British... They're the ones who are who want the monarchy back, and they're trying to put the monarchy back into Europe, back into France, um, and they're trying to stop him and before him the Directory from maintaining government because it would it's a threat to their monarchy monarchical powers. If you know France's monarchy can go down, then what's going to stop a revolution from happening in their own countries? Yeah, right. because it's one thing if the colonies do their own thing, but it's another if an established monarchy like France ends up going down. Right. It's 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 like it's bad enough that your colonies revolted, but if your own people and your own state revolt, you know, it's like, damn, we're 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 screwed. Like this is you know that whole that whole um, nobility, all those everyone in that class is pretty much you know heads are going to roll. So the fourth coalition po- pops up. Again, with the same players, Napoleon earns a huge, decisive victory against the Russians. That kind of comes into play because he's got his confidence there with the Russians. So what's going on? So the coalition keeps popping up, threatening his regime. So who's funding the coalitions? It's the UK. So the UK is encouraging and funding these coalitions more so than any other country. Napoleon wants to conquer Britain, and he wants to bring them into his big empire that he's forming in France. So he forms, he implements the continental system which puts an embargo on all British trade. And at first, Russia is going along with this embargo, but then seeing its economic uh, downside, decides they're going to sneak around Napoleon and trade with Russia and trade with Britain anyway. So they reopen trade with the UK. Napoleon says, no way. 
He decides to invade Russia to pressure Tsar Alexander to ending trade with the UK and then force UK force the UK to sue for peace. Basically trying to bring UK into his French Empire and also conquer the Brits. Which brings us to the invasion. <laughs> Do you have any, any any questions, any comments, concerns? I I am before. interested. <laughs> so I knew Napoleon invaded Russia. Yeah. I didn't realize it was because they essentially didn't want to go along with his tariffs or embargoes. That's basically it. They were they were kind of okay with it at first when he forms this continental system with a bunch of other countries too saying don't trade with Britain. Basically a Brexit but on the other side as if the European Union was like get out. We're not tr- we're not doing anything with you anymore. Um but then Russia, seeing that its economy was going down, was like, well, hold on a second. We have to trade with Britain. This isn't good. We're not doing well. Especially so, during that time, I'm sure Britain had all sorts of interesting exports for all sorts of different lively needs that the Russians had. They did. And they had the Industrial Revolution going on, too. So they were doing well. So their economy was booming. And actually, what's interesting when I was reading about this was that the UK's economy wasn't as negatively affected as Napoleon... Uh, would have liked because of this embargo because there was a lot of smuggling going on anyway and they were trading with them anyway it was just something that he wanted to impose but he also couldn't enforce it that well because the british had the best navy in the world yeah the british navy is not to be underestimated in this equation exactly so because of that it was like he, he tried to weaken the uk as much as possible to invade them failed miserably and said to himself, okay, well, what I'm going to do is now Russia went against me and this, you know, side note, Spain went against him too. So we tried to fight Spain as well. Two front war, not a great thing to do as we have seen throughout history. So Napoleon decides to invade Russia. And um, I sent Tony this before, but there's this great, there's this amazing infographic, which is how I even got interested in Napoleon invasion of Russia like years ago, but it's an infographic created by Charles Joseph Menard, who's a French civil engineer. And it depicts in a 2d platform, his disastrous 1812 campaign into Russia, because it has the representation of the number of Napoleon's troops, the distance traveled, the temperature, the latitude and longitude, the direction of the travel and the location, the relative to specific dates, which is incredible because you see like at the border of Poland um and russia by the neiman river he's got an army of like 600 something thousand troops and you can see the thickness of like the the graph that shows you know it's going from left to right of his travels through russia and it's a pretty thick you know bar showing how many troops he has so russia's no i mean napoleon's whole thing was okay we've got this grand army we've got hundreds of thousands of troops i'm going to try to to support my troops as best i can with supply lines ammunition food and whatnot but he was really relying on his troops to live off the land in order to survive the problem with that is when you've got this many troops going uh east into russia and russia basically keeps retreating and does what's called scorched earth tactics they just keep retreating and burning everything in their wake so there's no food to forage, there's no livestock to eat, and there's no shelter to stay in. So Napoleon's troops start dying by thousands, thousands, as they're going into Russia to try to defeat Tsar Alexander I and conquer Moscow. That, like The idea of trying to feed 600,000 people with today's standards of food, preservation, all that stuff seems like a daunting challenge to just be like, you guys will find it along the way. It's so foolish. It's it's basically what he's what he said. He's basically saying, look, um, I don't have I mean, I'm, I tried my best to get you guys the food and supplies you guys needed. Um, my supply lines are stretched so thin. Um, and this is the biggest army ever assembled to date. So you guys got to feed off the land, which worked in the past with him. But I think because of how vast Russia is and how thinly his supply lines were spaced out, it was just a disaster. So they just were dying. It's also worth, I think, pointing out that Napoleon, one of his innovations, if you want to call it that, in warfare, was the idea of total war. The idea that the entire country would be involved in supporting the army, that everybody 
had a part in the war effort and now he's sort of cut off from that like he he built up probably if my memory of this is correct because i haven't studied it like you have but he has this whole system where everybody's working together and now the army's like hundreds of miles into russia i don't know exactly how many hundreds but the further and further they go the less and less effective that machine that he's built is right and the whole and the other thing to even you know uh put a wrench into that is the fact that russia's burning everything as they retreat so good the strategy just, by the way yeah it's, i think it's, we before the great. call we talked about hannibal and uh s- same thing happens with rome they, they do the same thing to him right so basically they're taking all the supplies away from napoleon they're they're defeating they're not even defeating him he's winning little skirmishes and little battles along the way and there is this battle that you were talking about before battle in borodino Huge casualties. Um, that was, I think, Kine- how did you say? Kine? I've heard Kanai, Kine. With, uh, I don't know. Again, yeah. pronunciations are not our strong point. But it's, <laughs> yes, the only battle that equaled the casualties at Kanai or Kine or however you say it. Um, and that's if you divide both sides. So uh, Hannibal crushed the Romans in, like killed all of them if this one to get to the same number of deaths you have to take both sides of this battle so even there hannibal has the edge on the numbers yeah. game I, this from what i read i think was seventy thousand uh french troops lost i don't know how many russian but again russia didn't surrender at this battle either so russia keeps retreating napoleon keeps marching he gets to moscow and in moscow he finds the city abandoned and burning um, the Russians aren't there. They're not there to surrender. He expected them to be there to surrender. They're not there. Um, at this time, he's already depleted his forces to about 100,000 men. He started with 685. He's depleted them down to about 100,000 now. They've either died, deserted, or um, they're injured, and they couldn't press on. So that's what he's was cut most left. of this from the starvation. Was it from the cold? Was this from like what got rid of a, a five hundred thousand of those? It was, was it just like the yeah, persistence it, of the Russians? Like it sounds like it's a mix of everything. But that's a huge jump. It's a huge jump, and um, the infographic I mentioned before, kind of you can see it visually how much it depletes itself, the army. But it's from it's from casualties from battle, the fact that there's no food for them to eat. The, the cold weather the doesn't cold. actually play. Oh, it oh, does oh. play in here, but it doesn't play in until his retreat back from Moscow. He loses even, I mean, he loses a lot there, too, because he winds up. What ends up happening is he spends a month in Moscow, and the Tsar Alexander's not, not giving in. He's not surrendering. He doesn't want to sue for peace. He's just waiting Napoleon out and saying, look, if you want to stay here in Moscow, I'll stay here in Moscow. I don't care. If you want to, it's getting, it's, it's getting really cold. It's getting horrible. It's, you know, it's October now. It's, we're getting into November. You, you what are you going to stay here? What are you going to do? So in an he, empty city that I've burned already. Exactly. So the Russian winter hits, he's, the people are dying of hypothermia. There's like pockets of Russian uh, soldiers that keep attacking them and, and uh, people just civilians attacking them. They have no food. They're deserting now. They're leaving him behind. They're leaving Napoleon. So he says, all right, I'm out. So Napoleon, he, he's he's thinking, I have to retreat. So he's he leaves Moscow uh, defeated, basically, without you know without a battle. The Russians not fighting a battle in Moscow. He leaves. Um, and they go back. And then they lose approximately, There's they lose about 50,000 soldiers before they get to this crossing of a river called Berezina. We'll just say that that's the name. And at that point, at that crossing, they lose another... 22,000 at that crossing alone and then just according to the river or to yeah the just battle? to just to the river well whoever i mean from what it says it's at the river but there could have been i guess like bat fights or people who didn't want to cross but died of starvation or but according to this the number of troops that he made back to the to the neiman river where he started at the poland russian border he comes back he crosses the finish line with about ten thousand men I have, Which is I have some questions based on geography. I, well, first I have a comment for those who are dumb like me at geography. I have pulled the the map of Russia and Europe up on the Google Globe thing. I never <laughs> yeah. realized Moscow is about 5% of the way into the mainland of Russia from yeah. Europe. 
Yeah. Like, they had... I, I, you know, there's the... I knew the basic idea of the Russians continuing to tr- retreat into Russia. I had no idea how much farther they could have gone based on just how big this country is. Oh, now, yeah. I don't know how much of it is hospitable to people. Well, I- I'm sure, like, his goal was more to get Alexander to surrender or to come to terms with him. Like, there might not have been a complete let's take over every inch of Russia in his head. But, like, usually whenever you go and you take the capital city from someone, like, that's whenever the war is over. Or it's whenever, like, like, things go severely in your favor. And I can't even imagine the frustration of getting to the capital city and seeing that they didn't even care. And they're like, yeah, come find us. Have fun. (laughs) Exactly. It's kind of like, like Hitler going into, you know, invading Paris. Like, that was it. France done. France conquered. But like, you know, Alexander, uh, Napoleon comes into Moscow, burns it, evacuates it, says, uh, you know, have fun in in Moscow for as long as you want, I guess. I mean, that's basically kind of what it was like. And then that's exactly what happened with a lot of uh, a lot of the Soviet stuff in World War Two as well, is that. Stalin actually had the factories so that they could be packed up and moved deeper into Russia so he wouldn't lose his, like, airplane factories or his munitions factories. Whenever they saw that, like, there was a certain amount of distance between, like, the the front lines, they would just pack up the entire factory and move more inland. Right. And I don't know if this actually applies to this, but I don't, have you guys ever seen The Princess Bride? Yes. So yes. There's, a, there's a part where he's sitting across the table from, what is his name, Benzini? Benzini or something? And he Benzini. says... Benzini. Yeah, and he says, Vicini. Um, yeah, yeah Vicini, and he says, you've made one of the biggest blunders and whatever it is, and then he says, don't get in a land war in Asia, and it's kind of like, you know, I think if you can't, you can't, like, get your supply lines in order if you're going to go fight a war in Asia, because the landmass is just too big. is also uh, maybe a backtrack question a little bit, but also, as a dummy of geography, I never really thought about this. France is not next to Russia. I mean, I knew that. I, I'm not a complete moron. But right. hearing this story told, it's like, well, France went into Russia. But they, like, Germany he, and Poland, were they okay with that? <laughs> well, he was he already controlled those areas. That was his empire already. He already had that. Like, Napoleon was doing well. He was doing well for himself. He got a little greedy. Went into Russia, thought. He wanted Britain really bad. I think he wanted to conquer Britain really badly. And he wanted to bring them into his empire. And he, the Russians went against him. And I think he thought that he had no choice but to make, you know, Alexander submit. And then if he made him submit, then he was thinking the UK's economy would collapse and he could go in and invade. As Unfortunately, if the it didn't UK work that is that way. dependent on Russia to begin with, right? right. It, that doesn't seem to be right. like an I mean, accurate assessment. <laughs> I agree. I think it's I think it's crazy and i think people from what i've read online and what i've read you know from what i remember in like high school and even a couple college courses it was an insane thing like people thought that he was becoming insane like he was losing a little bit of his luster is what they you know was what i remember from like about 1810 starts putting on the putting on the weight getting a little crazy um and i think he just did something that he thought was going to be you know a decisive win for him and it wasn't and he ends up he ends up suffering immensely in terms of his reputation, his power. Um, the Grand Armée is reduced to a fraction of its size and his allies start abandoning him because they don't see this great general anymore. They see this big loser. Um, and then the, the, the sixth coalition starts again. And this time, um, the result of that campaign ends up with Napoleon's abdication and his exile to Elba. And like we said, he would return from exile. Uh, but then the Seventh Coalition, apparently, this is the final coalition, brings him down at Waterloo. And that's it. He's done. But from what we've learned, you don't get in a land war in Asia. You don't spread your supply lines so thin. And uh, you don't try to forage off the land when your enemy is just burning everything in your wake. <laughs> yeah, bring some food with you. I know, you, I know we invented margarine. Right. Come on now. Or the baguette. You could put some. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they've, all got, they've all got stick bread. Coming they've out all of got backpack. stick bread. Yeah. 
as a side note for what we were talking about earlier for the uh, the actual territories that were covered, I'm looking at a map of Europe in 1810, and it's showing that the Austrian Empire was uh, completely controlled by Napoleon's brother-in-law. Like he, he and he had a bunch of satellite states, so he could basically walk over to Russia. But even over the course of that, that's still a lot of resources to get to Russia. Whenever you don't even have like you're not even able to bring your people mostly on horseback. So it's a lot of supplies to get that far. Imagine trying to like get like 10 of your friends together to travel anywhere. It's a pain in the ass, <laughs> let alone like 600 something thousand troops to get them all to move. I mean, that that train, that that army train, it's, you know, hundreds of miles long. Well, I don't know about hundreds of miles, but it's long and it's the supply lines are stretched too thin. It was a bad move. It was a really bad move because he looked he had a decent control over the European continent. He had a decent control. He was Emperor of France. He was well liked. He wasn't, you know, there was no, oh, I don't want to say there's no inkling that he was, you know, in decline or anything like that. But this was kind of the catalyst of his decline and kind of basically for a lot of historians, from what I read, I'm not a historian myself, but from what I read, is the main cause of his abdication, exile, and just overall decline from. And it's over a tariff. And it's, it's over an embargo. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. It's over his... to think, like, if you lose 600,000 Frenchmen, I don't know what percentage of the population that was at the time. Like, every single Frenchman, everybody that's part of, like, the uh, the Empire that had, like, allies in that war, everybody's going to know somebody who died in Russia. They're going to have those negative feelings that they lost a piece of their family over this embargo, and they're just not going to want to support the person that forced them into that situation and wasted those lives for absolutely no gain. It's it's incredible that he be, that he goes from being so popular to so unpopular so quickly, and apparently and somehow makes a comeback and makes a comeback and then fails. But apparently, when they when the troops were retreating from Moscow as well, he tr- he told his officers, "I'm going to race back to Paris before you guys," because he wanted to head off the news of this failure so bad, and he wanted to like start calling on more troops to feed into his army just so it didn't look like. He lost that big of a, uh, a campaign. I thought that was interesting. That he, his ego, he was like, I can't have people knowing this. So he rushed back to try to head off the news before it reached Paris. I have so, an impression that I'd like to run by you as far like having listened to what you said. It feels to me like Napoleon is, to put it in pop culture terms, Kind of like Robert Baratheon from Game of Thrones (laughs) in that he's a great warrior. Like if you'll go up against him on the battlefield, he will just whip you. But he doesn't necessarily have the sense to govern the sense to understand like the bigger picture and know when it's a good idea to fight. And ultimately he isn't a good ruler because of that great general. Horror yeah, I would ruler. I would agree with most of that. He comes from like um, middle nobility too. I mean, Robert Baratheon was the head of his own house, but um, yeah, Napoleon comes from like mid mid tier nobility from Corsica. But yeah, great general, great sense of of military uh, tactics, and I think they still study his military tactics today. But in terms I mean, of considering he was a general at twenty four, yeah, like in a meritocracy, that is a pretty intense thing. That is a really int- that's crazy. And I, I think it's also kind of cr- I just never knew. I mean, this is a fun fact, but I know I did not know that he was Italian and did not speak French until he was 10. I thought that was just that to me was like, oh, I, just, I thought he was like a French state statesman. I thought he was just like all in on France. Do you, did you get the sense that he had some kind of accent? So it said it said he did. It said he had like a Corsican accent and not really a uh, French accent. So when they do that, like, you know, that stereotypical french accent for him it's not necessarily accurate and he was big on trying to get corsica independence trying to get it you know out of france Uh, even when he was the head of france i don't think when he got to be the head of france i i mean i didn't see any more mentioning of that during my limited research of him trying to get corsica back into you know its own independent state but before that he was okay So a guy that was sort of a rebel in a lot of ways, trying to like diminish the French Empire, ends up being at the head of it and causes the biggest expansion and then the most rapid like <laughs> deflating of that well, as po- you could possibly have. I, I always think it's kind of. Cr- I always like think about um, Fidel Castro. The guy, like the guy, wanted the revolution in Cuba so bad, 
And then he becomes the leader of Cuba, and it's what the he- like. This is so bad. This is horrible. You're worse. Like, it's <laughs> unbelievable. It's it's they 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 preach this whole revolution. We want a revolution. You know, even Robespierre too. Even before they decapitated him, but or I don't know if they decapitated Robespierre actually. Maybe they executed him. But anyway, they want the revolution. But then when they get the power themselves, they're like, well. I know what I'm doing. I'll be the dictator. Statesmanship is hard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, well, I know what I'm doing. I- I'm good at this. I know what's best for the people. I'll be the dictator. That's so. like the story of like so many different African countries where it's like you just have like warlords deposing warlords and doing the exact same thing whenever they get up there. People's liberation armies turning into tyrants immediately after they like gain power. Right. Exactly. You didn't do all that fighting to let people vote. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they might not like what you all fought for. Right. Uh, if they're not going to vote for me, then forget this revolution. Or you get those like Liberian elections where it's like, wow, like four times the population of your entire country voted for just you and no one else. <laughs> right. We he, the the leader got two million votes uh, when only one point five million people voted. Yes, that's that makes total sense. It's a good yeah. thing they got rid of that, and there's definitely nobody. Voting for stuff in Great Britain anymore. Really right. Put the cork in that problem. Right. Yes. I, I just love that they <laughs> shipped him across the Atlantic, too. They were like, oh, well, Elba didn't work out because he, he escaped that too quickly. So we're just going to send him to, I think it was St. Helena is where they sent I'm not 100% positive, but they sent him across the Atlantic and then he died of stomach cancer. Not Gotta a good way say, to go, especially in those days. <laughs> no, not the best. I have to say, Corsica. Looks like a good place to go on vacation. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it looks like an it. awesome spot. Like, middle of the Mediterranean. Like, I bet it's wonderful. Food's probably amazing, too. Everything oh, yeah. probably there is amazing. Yeah. Probably move there and just have a great life. <laughs> so, to <laughs> recap, what was Napoleon's bad idea? So, his bad idea was just the invasion of Russia on its own. On its face. It was just a terrible idea. He already had The motivation, the execution, yeah. all of that. The motivation, the idea that he would be able to make Tsar Alexander I submit to him and continue with the UK embargo that would cripple the UK economy, that would then turn UK's economy bad, that he could then invade. It's just, there's too many, too many steps, especially trying to invade Russia. is just insane. It's never going to work. I don't think it's yeah, ever going to work. Especially because they, they didn't have the, like, they didn't have the infrastructure set up to be able to stop smuggling anyway so even if he had taken russia it's like would he have really been stopping that much of the uk's imports exactly so that's just bad idea not a good one should have just stayed in france just ruled <laughs> france you would have been fine stayed yeah you had almost all of europe You're right snorkeling man right exactly yeah. <laughs> or even at the same time you've just been like look guys i'm done i'm gonna go to my vacation home in corsica do some snorkeling got greedy <laughs> Well, I think that'll do it for this episode. Thank you so much, Tuna, for, uh, for coming on me. and tell us, telling us about that. I really enjoyed that. I learned things. I, As I mentioned earlier, I knew about the sort of broad strokes of the invasion, the motivations. That that was completely new to me and very interesting to hear about that, as well as all the details of the invasion. Thank you so much for coming on. Your podcast is once again the unranked. unranked. Yes, the unranked podcasts for video game enthusiasts and people who like to hear me complain about things in our lives. <laughs> and do you guys have any social media we should hit you up on? So it's uh, at unranked podcast on Twitter. Um, I'm at Tuna Targaryen on Twitter. For those of you who'd like to get a hold of us, you can email us at b. Bad ideas show at gmail.com. Uh, many of you have sent in bad ideas you'd like us to cover. If you have one that you have not heard us cover, you should send it in there. We really appreciate getting those emails. And we'll see you guys next week with another one. Thanks, everybody. Bye. <laughs>